All right, if you would open your Bibles this evening to Isaiah chapter 9. That's Isaiah chapter 9. We will read verses 1 through 7. But our focus this evening will be in verses 3 through 5. Before we do that, however, let's kind of recap some of what happened, what we spoke about last time. Last time we read in Isaiah of someone in anguish that was set free. We examined that, the, that there was a promise of redemption to the people as the, uh, that Isaiah was speaking to, a promise of being given joy. We kind of examined the situation. There were enemy armies marching towards uh, them with the, the intent of destruction. And even more than that, we saw that just previously in the, in the prophet's words to the people, an even greater destruction had been promised. So the, uh, the, the, the prophet is speaking in a time when the people are facing sure destruction. And for the first part of this book, all the way up until chapter 40 of Isaiah, the, Isaiah is prophesying doom prophesying the coming of Babylon and even greater doom beyond that, as we saw back in chapter 7. But the promise in Isaiah 9 continues from just joy to the promise of uh, the relief of despair and even death itself. The text promises that those who walked in darkness would see a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, as we talked about those Hebrew words that are often translated The valley of the shadow of death, a light would shine on them. The The author of the text, Isaiah, is saying that even in death, this promise exists for God's people. It is uh, something that he will do, as we will see even more tonight. Even in death, this hope exists. It's not a, it's not a, uh, um, it's not something that, that they can necessarily hope for in their lifetime. Uh, matter of fact, they've been promised a, a, a potentially short life as the different kings that they hold in fear uh, are around them. Babylon and, and um, Assyria march and destroy all of Judah and Israel, and rightfully so, because God had called his covenant pact. He had said, if you do my will, you will be blessed. If you do not, if you do not keep my commandments, you will be cursed. Israel for 400 years or more had not kept God's commandments and they reaped the reward of that. But even in the middle of this promise of death, there was a promise of hope, a promise of joy, a promise that even in the valley of the shadow of death, there would be salvation. We talked about last time how no historical event in the history of the world, sums up the understanding of this passage. I think Calvin summed up our understanding of this last time very well when he said, If therefore we extend the commencement of the deliverance from the return from Babylon down to the coming of Christ, on whom all liberty and all bestowal of blessing depends, we shall understand the true meaning of this passage, which otherwise has not been satisfactorily explained, by commentators. What Calvin is saying and what we understand from that, this passage is that we can't point to the return after Babylon and say, well, this is when this joy or hope came. We can't point to uh, any event in history, the rebuilding of the temple in uh, Nehemiah's time, or the, the building of Herod's temple in Jesus' time. We can't point to any physical event other than the child that is born for understanding these uh, events. The New Testament tells us that on Christ, all the hope of Israel rises. The the fortunes of Israel rise and fall with Christ. That's the promise. The, The man Simeon waits in the temple. And what does he wait for? But the consolation of Israel. He waits for the Christ to come. And when he says, when he sees Christ, he says, this is the joy. This is the, the long awaited Messiah. With that said, Let's read Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. There will be no gloom for, who, for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations, 
The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as, uh, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, and, un, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's, may God bless the reading of his holy and infallible word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we take the privilege, humbly but boldly, to come before your throne, to ask for wisdom to understand this text. Your word instructs us specifically that if we lack wisdom, we should ask and you will give it. Lord, we recognize our human frailty, our inability to know absolute truth without it being revealed to us through your word by your spirit. We ask for that wisdom, Father, the wisdom that comes from above. We ask that you banish the wisdom from below, the demonic wisdom that would, that would creep in from all around. Lord, that we would be faithfully found interpreting and understanding the text as you have intended it to be understood. We ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. With what we covered last time, talked about this understanding of this, looking at these events and not really, you know, not being able to pin them anywhere but in the person of Jesus Christ, let's jump into verse 3. I've kind of titled this section of the sermon, Joy grounded in Christ. Now, Isaiah 9, 3 reads, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are, uh, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. That first phrase there, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. It's interesting that the, the author, or the, the, the speaker, uh, em emphasizes the, the idea of increase. Both those words, multiply or increase, uh, the, the joy, they, they, they mean the same thing. They mean to increase something. So the, the author starts right off with a, with a double emphasis. You're going to multiply and you're going to increase. This, this, is, this is adding these two terms together to speak of a great increase in joy. It is to, the author wants us to understand that the, the joy he's talking about is not a little happiness. It is not, uh, okay, the, the nation is a little more happy than it used to be. No, the people that he's talking about, the people who have them increased, it's double fold. It's above and beyond. It's a joy that cannot be um, suppressed or put down. It is a bountiful increase in joy by God. Um, it goes with the rest of the, the passage here. You'll notice, it, it depends on which translation you're reading it. Some translate joy, gladness, rejoice, diff with different words. But the author uses four words, joy. In the, in the ESV, it's joy, rejoice, and then the word joy again, and then the word glad. As if he's trying to emphasize a point. Uh, that you can't escape what the, the author is saying. This, this, this is uh, joy given. This, is, this joy leads to rejoicing. And it's joy again, and it leads to what? Gladness. There's, there's these four words, as um, Calvin points out. It's as if Isaiah had said, there, was never great, uh, uh, there never was greater joy. Though the multitude of the people was greater, though we are few and contemptible in number, yet by the light 
with which thou shinest on us. Thou hast cheered us to such a degree that no joy of our former condition may be compared to the present. Um, so, you know, let's, let's stop and think about this for a moment. We're talking about the, the rich, current condition of Israel. There's, if, if it's in Hezekiah's day, there's as many as two million soldiers bearing shields at the king's command. Um, the, the nation is, or has been for several hundred years, very wealthy, very well known around the world. People cut willing to come and trade with them. In the days of uh, uh, David and Saul, before the enemies of Israel are put down, the, the nation grows. It, uh, Solomon is one of the richest kings ever, one of the richest people to ever exist in the entire world. And what the, the author of Isaiah is saying is all of that, everything that's come before, everything that you could point to and say, well, Solomon's day, when the nation was the richest nation in the world, that was the greatest joy. Or David's day, when all of the enemies of Israel were put under our feet. There was no more war because David won all the war. That was the greatest day. And the author of Isaiah is saying that the previous joy, the joy uh, from before, even the highest point, is, does not compare with the joy that's coming. And how do we know the difference? The author, Isaiah, doesn't give us the um, option of understanding this joy apart from adversity. The, the, this statement in the middle of the text says, the one who was in anguish will have this joy. The one who was walking in the shadow of jet death will have this joy. The joy is presented as a joy that triumphs over adversity. It overcomes the adversity and is joyous even in the middle of the struggles. So it's not a joy that's not dependent on when David ruled and Israel was the, the, the head honcho with, with the biggest army. It isn't dependent on Solomon's riches or wisdom. It's a joy that even in darkness, even in the valley of the shadow of death, overcomes the first person to experience this joy was John the Baptist, at least the one recorded, at least the first person recorded in Scripture as he leaps in his mother's womb at the coming of Christ. He leaps for joy as Christ enters the room. So when it says that uh, they rejoice before you, it locates the joy and where it comes from. Mary received this joy as well as she prophesied after that event, calling, the, calling uh, amazement at the Lord, calling her blessed to be the conduit, to be the instrument God used to enter His Son into the world. This joy didn't come to Mary because she had great wealth. It didn't come to a, uh, John the Baptist because he had anything. He was an infant in the womb, but he had this joy. This joy transcends any physical thing that happens. And the, the Lord gives us a very specific statement right in the middle of this passage. They rejoice before you. And this, is, this is right in the middle of the passage. It's really important. It's one of those things that is not repeated over in the passage. The, the amount of the joy is, is repeated, it's multiplied, it's increased. The word joy is used over and over again. Rejoicing is used. Gladness is used. But there's only one location for that joy and gladness. Before you. They rejoiced before you. It's very important that this is right at the center of the verse and that it's not repeated. The verse has three parts. How much the joy is increased, who rejoices, and where they rejoice. The where they rejoice is before you. Consider that for a moment there. Uh, it says you've multiplied the nation. You've increased its joy. They rejoice before you. There's a, there's a grounding statement here. Before you. This is, this is where the, the, the joy is grounded. It's not a temporary joy. It's an eternal joy. It's not temporary because it's not grounded in things like we've already talked about. It's not grounded in Solomon's wisdom or riches. It's not grounded in success for Israel. It's not grounded in whether the nation goes to Babylon or not or whether the Babylonians come and destroy. It's grounded in the eternal God. It's grounded in who He is. And as um, 
we get further on, it, it will become very evident why it is important that Jesus is named so specifically in verse 6. It's a joy grounded in God. Calvin, and I hope you'll bear with me, I quote him a lot tonight because he just has a lot of really good things to say about this. He's commenting on the, on the words before you there. And he says, he means that the joy, he's talking, when he says he means, he's talking about Isaiah. Isaiah means, or God means, that the joy was true and complete, not slight or temporary. Men often rejoice, but with deceitful and transitory joy, which is followed by mourning and tears. The author Isaiah, or the Lord, affirms that this joy has its roots deeply laid, so deeply laid, that it can never perish or be destroyed. We're not talking about a temporary joy. We see that God is the center and ground for this hope. The people of Israel, as we've pointed out already, are facing a coming disaster. They will, if you'll excuse the pun, face a disaster of biblical proportions. Their nation will be destroyed. Their people uh, killed. Their the survivors hauled away as slaves. The land where they used to live left completely desolate. Their homes deserted and destroyed. In the oasis, as, as Isaiah prepares God's people for this event, Isaiah reminds the people that those who wait on God have hope and joy even in the face of these trials, even in the difficulties that will come. And if we are to look for an illustration of this, it is good, uh, I find it a good thing to find sermon illustrations. If we are to look at an illustration for this, I don't think it's better to look than, than to look at the saints themselves. If you, if you look at the history of Christianity, um, John Calvin, for example, um, had migraines his whole life. He wrote all these great works. He was a, he was a professor of theology. He started a school uh, for theology. His, his community sent missionaries all over the world, and he dealt his whole life with a sickly body. Many times he would teach his uh, classes from his bedroom, out of his bed, because he didn't have the strength to get out of it. And yet he writes this. He writes, Now hence it is evident that uh, evident what brings what Christ brings us, namely the full and perfect joy, of which we cannot in any way be robbed or deprived. Though various storms or and tempests should arise, and though we should be weighed down by every kind of affliction, however weak and feeble we may be, we still ought to be glad and joyful. For the ground of our joy does not lie in numbers or wealth or outward splendor, but in the spiritual happiness which we obtain through the word of Christ. This man who is suffering what many, most of us would consider debilitating. I don't know about you, but I don't write stuff like that when I have a migraine. I don't, I don't get out of bed um, you know, when I'm sick and keep going and say I'm joyful. But this is the, the testimony of the saints throughout history. There's a famous one we've spoken about many times Horatio G. Spatford, uh, Spatford, yeah, that's right, who lost his business, he went bankrupt, he lost his daughters at sea, and we know the hymn well. He writes, it is well with my soul. And notice the locus, the location of his joy. My sin, he says, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Those are just a couple of examples of countless saints who have faced lions, fire, beheading, torture, starvation, and have yet held on to unshakable faith in God. What is this faith? What, is, what, holds, what holds them in faith? But the joy that Isaiah speaks of here, a joy that isn't located in their circumstances. It isn't located in what they have. And why can it be so complete? Well, the author actually, Isaiah, gives us that understanding. This joy is the same kind of joy at the end of the harvest or the end of the battle. Look further down in the verse now, if you'll see the last part. He moves on from where the joy is, and he starts to, to describe the kind of joy. He says, They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, 
as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Think about the, the illustration that the author is giving us here. What is the harvest? Why, is, why would Isaiah point us to, a, to joy at the harvest? Well, the harvest is at the end of the work. The crops have been planted, watered, fed, and they're being, they're, they have been harvested. They're, the food, the work is done. The, the, the bounty is applied. The, the, the reward for all of the effort is at hand. It's the same when they divide the spoils. Isaiah goes on and says, they're glad when they divide the spoil. Well, what, again, what is happening there? It's the end of the battle. The fear of death from the battle is replaced with the joy of victory, with the, the completion of the work. Instead of, uh, instead of the impending facing of, of potential death uh, on the battlefield, the reward and victory is at hand. When we apply this, dear friends, Saints, adopted of the Lord, victory in Christ is what the author is saying. This victory that he's promising, this is what Isaiah is promising, is complete. And he goes on and get, in the next couple of verses will give us examples of that. Is, is there a night of sorrow? Has anguish ravaged your soul? Is there... Night in your soul. These are things that Christians experience. This is reality. There are times of sorrow. There are times of pain. There are times where our very lives are asked of us. If we look across Christian history, this is the the truth. But with Christ, light is promised. The darkness is gone. Jesus is the light. And we can say with Calvin, that though various storms and tempests should rise, and though we should be weighed down by every kind of affliction, the ground of our joy does not lie in numbers or wealth or outward splendor, but in spiritual happiness. With Horatio, we can proclaim, it is well with my soul. I want to be very clear this evening. It is not a fake joy. It's not a joy that says, I have a smile on my face and I'm just going to keep smiling because that's what I should do. I should look joyful. No, this is real joy. The the Bible instructs us over and over again that lying is wrong. Pretending that we're not hurting is is not true. It's not living in truth. Jesus said that the saints of God would worship God in spirit and in truth. You can't worship God and live a lie. The Heartache is real. The loss is real. The sickness and pain, those are real. We don't pretend them away. Now this is what I would call, I would use the word gritty. This is a gritty joy that can stand in the face of those trials and say, it is well with my soul. That can sail across an ocean where his daughters have just died and write, it is well with my soul. There is no doubt that the man suffered the feeling of loss as he sailed over that ocean, but this joy stuck. This is a joy that comforts in God's promises. It leans on them, and in so doing, turns the trial into a reward, the reward of endurance and faith. As the saints of old have shown over and over and over again, that the reward of faith, the gritty joy that sticks, is the one that Christians have. The one that, the joy that can't be knocked away because of a a current battle. Because the saints recognize God's victory is already won. God's victory is already won. That's what, when we go on into verse 4, that's exactly what the uh, author is getting at with the analogies that he uses. God's victory. The victory is God's. And that's why in the face of pain, in the face of sorrow, in the face of all of the things that a Christian will struggle with, the answer is, it is well with my soul. The victory is won. Take a look at verse 4 there. The author uses three descriptions of oppression. It says, For the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. That first part, the first three statements there, is, is... the Hebrew way of emphasizing the amount of the oppression. If you think about it, 
it's like uh, he, the author is heaping terms upon each other. It does it a lot in this passage. He uses one example after another, after another of oppression. He talks about a yoke, a yoke that binds the people. He talks about the staff. Think about the, the uh, taskmaster uh, from Egypt or the taskmaster uh, over the slave who has the rod and lays it on his shoulder. says, I'm going to hit you with this if you don't work harder. That's the picture of the staff and the um, rod of his oppressor. So we have the, the yoke. The, the burden of slavery, the, the correction or the, or the punishment, the torture of the slave master, and the implement that's used, the rod. These pictures, these, these designs are put together for us to understand that this is the worst kind of oppression. The yoke, the staff, the rod, these, these pictures are put together to, to show this, this, the depth and breadth of the oppression that, the, the, that it will be broken. The Babylonian atrocities that will come are a mere outward uh, sign or outward example of the oppression that Isaiah is talking about. Yes, the people of Israel will be oppressed by the Babylonians. When the Babylonians come and lay siege to Jerusalem, the stories and depictions, although written actually quite artfully and carefully in uh, Lamentations. Don't hide the darkness. Women and children ripped apart. Babies thrown against walls. Starvation to where people are eating their own children. The worst kind of atrocities. And then the whole nation carried away as slaves. This visually represents the destruction that the author is talking about. The Israelites were facing destruction as a nation. And that is not, that is is but death in this life. The the oppression, this worst kind of oppression, this, this total oppression that the author is talking about is the bondage to sin. The inability to do what is good, and even worse, the desire, no desire to do what is good. The kind of oppression we're talking about here is what we call the doctrine of total depravity. Man's nature completely enslaved to sin with no hope of escape. The, even in death, there's no hope of escape. There's no way to escape the oppression that, that we're talking about. Death, if it were just death, uh, or if it were just a physical um, oppression, then death would release us from that. But this oppression is not released by death. How do we know? Well, the author has already said that this light that's coming is going to free those even in the shadow of death, even in the valley of death. This oppression that he's addressing, in the context that he's addressing it, exists even after death. And then the author gives the pronunciation. You, God, have broken. The staff, the rod, the yoke are broken. If we think about his statement here, it's it's very straightforward. You, God, have broken. You have ended this oppression. The author gives us a picture of total depravity, total depression, total slavery, even after death, and says, God, you have broken this. You have broken this. And he goes on to give us an illustration. He goes on to explain how God has broken that. The Scripture's promise of Christ over and over and over again that He will be the one to break the chains, to rescue His people, the salvation of His people. The the book of Isaiah is full of these promises. Psalm chapter 2, verse 9 says, You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Every enemy that has stood or stood up to God is placed under Christ's feet. And how is it done? How does God free his people from the worst kind of oppression? The author gives us an illustration. He says, you have broken them as on the day of Midian. Well, why does the author use the example of Midian? If we understand the the historical context, the, the author is speaking of Gideon and the Midianites who oppressed Israel for many years, and God used Gideon to free them from the Midianites. But if you read that story, the story of 
Gideon and the Mid Midianites, you don't go, wow, Gideon did a real good job winning that fight. When you read the story of Gideon over having victory over the, the Midianites, you look at that and say, that was God's victory. God did that. That wasn't, that wasn't a, a plan. It's God's victory over Midian. God's sovereignty over the situation. God's calling and electing and saving of his people that Isaiah is pointing the Israelites to. He says, just like God won the victory over Midian, God's going to win the victory here. That you can have, God's people can have this, I've used the word gritty joy, this, this joy that, that sticks because the uh, victory is won by God. Let's, um, let's explore the, the illustration that Isaiah is using here for a moment. As I was thinking about this, um, if you think about the victory, what kind of battle plan did Gideon really have? Right? Like, here, go down to this army of over 100,000 people, like 120,000 fighting men, with 300 guys. And oh, by the way, when you get there, you're not going to fight you're going to smash pottery and yell really loud. Even uh, the best military strategist would never have come up with that idea. So when we ask whose victory was it over Midian, we reply, surely it wasn't Gideon's. Yet, at the same time, Gideon shared in the victory. Gideon took the, the pot and the sword, and he took all the guys, and he went down there, and he did exactly as God said to do, and the camp of Midian killed itself before the fear of the Lord. Let's ask the question of ourselves in application. Whose victory is it over sin? Surely not ours. But we share in the same victory. That's the joy that Isaiah is getting at here. The victory is already won. And it isn't, uh, it isn't a victory that God has done and then kept to himself. No, God shared this victory with all of us. God shared the victory over sin, and because of that victory, we say, it is finished. And that leads us to the, the final verse for tonight, verse 5, where the author drives this point home about the completion of the war, how the, how the battle is done. See, we could say, and think about this like, a, vic a, a victory in a battle. Let's say we let's let's think about history for a moment. Uh, think about the Battle of the Bulge. We eventually win. The Allies finally win the day after great sacrifice. The Battle of the Bulge is one of the turning points in the war. The battle is won, but the war isn't over. We're not talking about the the kind of victory here that is the victory over a certain battlefield. We're ta talking about victory in Europe Day. VE Day, when the armistice is signed, the, the war is over, the fighting is done. We're talking about the celebration of the returning troops home, never to go to need to, war to, need to, go to war again, a final victory. And that's what verse 5 spells out for us. Isaiah 9, verse 5 says, For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Every boot... It says, and every garment burned in the fire. Why? The war is over. Right? You don't need the boot anymore for stomping on the enemy. You don't need the, the combat gear anymore to go into the fight. The battle is over. There's no need for it anymore. Again, it says the garment, every garment rolled in blood is burned as fuel for the fire. There's no point in keeping around the, the blood-soaked, the blood-stained, battle clothes anymore. There's no, no worry that you're going to have to put them back on. You need to find another use for them, so you warm yourself by burning them in the fire. So we see now how this passage only makes sense with Christ. In Christ in, 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 we look back over, over history, over the history of the Jewish people, over the history of the world, there's never a point where you need to burn the, the, the boots. You need to burn the clothes. We can't point to a physical, uh, a physical example of where this happens. We, can, we can't point and say, oh, prophet, I understand what you're talking about. I've seen this. This happened, and it happened here. No, even 
when the Israelites return from Babylon, they don't do so in peace. As they stand on the, and, and build the temple, I, um, Nehemiah records that when, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, he records that our enemies, when our enemies heard that, um, heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work, in peace. No, that's not what he says. From that day on, half my servants worked on the construction and half held spears and bows and coats of mail. The, even in the return from Babylon, even when you could say, well, the, the Babylonian captivity is over, there's still a need for swords. There's still a need for, uh, for battle equipment to be held and ready to go because of raids. They may have returned from captivity, but they still had to be ready for battle. And in some ways, this applies to Christians as well. This applies to believers. We are, we are, but we are not yet. We celebrate a completed victory. When Christ said, Teletestai on the cross, it is finished. He meant it. It's done. Period. But we still have battle. We still have work as saints. We still are the people of God, ready to fight. We have spiritual warfare. We have to fight sin in ourselves. We have to fight against oppression around us. We have to speak uh, the truth in love to people who hate us. It is not a, a, a place of peace, which is why it is so important that we understand how the people of God have joy. Ezra and Nehemiah, they still have swords in their hands. But the people of God have joy because Christ is coming. The prophecy of Isaiah, as Calvin said, when we, when we shift the focus and look to understand these passages in Christ as, as Christ's fulfillment, we understand that, that it is victory in Christ. What is it that the Apostle Paul says, but we are more than conquerors because we win the fight? No, in Christ. We are more than conquerors because of Christ, because of what Christ has done. That's the thesis statement of all of the end of chapter 8 for the Apostle Paul. No height, no depth, no, no uh, enemy, no, no army, no nothing can keep us from the love of God. That is the gritty joy. That's the joy that sticks for God's people. And it's the same joy that Ezra and Nehemiah could have looking forward to Christ. And it is even greater joy for us looking back on Christ's completion. As we conclude this evening... We'll get into verse 6 next time. And it starts with the words, For unto us a child is born. I think it is appropriate to wrap up here to, to clarify why this is so important that it points to Christ. The author has said, There's a person who will be in anguish, and that anguish will be no more. There's a, a land who is subject currently to to repute, and that repute will be no more. There's people in darkness and despair. That despair will be no more when this light comes. There are people in the shadow of death. That death will be no more. That, that, that fear of death will be no more when this light comes. And then he says, look, the, 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 the joy that's going to come from this is multiplied over and over and over again. It's grounded in God's promise. It is set uh, it, it is set because it is the end of the battle. The oppressor has no hold on these people anymore. The yoke, the rod, and the staff, they're broken. The, uh, the author says, there's no more need for the battle clothes. The battle's been won. So we ask the question, why is there lasting victory? The author answers in verse 6, a child is born. Why is there joy instead of anguish? A child is born. How has God won the victory? A child is born. All the peace offered those besieged Israelites thousands of years ago is the same peace offered every beset sinner today. And it's found in this child. So, when, so very well did the angels say, peace on earth and goodwill to men, that Christmas day that Christ was born. We will consider more on who this child is next time. May the peace of God be with you. Be with all of you, and all of God's people said, Amen.